Yeah, sorry for the late start. Um, very fresh as, as usual. Um, welcome to another cross team seminar. We've got another three speakers um, today. As usual, each speaker will be given twelve minutes uh, to talk about their um, topic of choice, and it'll be five minutes worth of questions as well. Sometimes we run a little bit over time, so I'll be chairing to try and keep us on time. Um, I'll be checking for questions online as well. We've got Jonathan right online to look for online questions. Um, I think uh, our first speaker today is Kevin Wing, uh, and you're going to talk about randomised control trials and informational data. I'm try and minimise this thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, Sorry, great. Thanks, mate. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, using randomized, randomized controlled trials to inform observation study design in big data, particularly looking at um, where the medicines work in, in people who actually use them. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about randomized controlled trials. Then I'm going to talk about a little bit about observational studies, a study design based on a hypothetical randomized controlled trial. And then I'm going to talk about study design based on actual randomized controlled trials. And that's where I'm going to give a couple of my own examples. So first of all, just a little bit about randomized controlled trials. So studies of drug treatment effects, um, evidence from well-performed randomized controlled trials is often con considered to be the gold standard. And why is that? So in a randomized controlled trial, you've got people eligible to receive new treatment, and they are randomized to hear treatment A, treatment B. And at randomization, uh, the groups are balanced in terms of their characteristics. So that means that if you're following them up, the, the, the effects that you can see, you can, you, you know, they're causal and they're going to be related to the treatment if it, everything's done properly. But also there's some issues with randomized controlled trials. So often they have short, short follow-up because um, financial reasons or whatever. It's not always feasible um, to do a trial for ethical or financial reasons. So things like old medicines, Comparative effects of old medicines, it's not going to be money for that. They're underpowered to investigate population subgroups and the strict inclusion exclusion criteria. For example, there might be no comorbidities, no mild severe disease in the people that are recruited, and people on other treatments might be excluded. So, what about observational studies in big data? So, perhaps observational analysis of big data can fill in some of these gaps from randomized controlled trials. So what I'm talking about here is very large databases of routinely collected electronic health records. So they have very large, very large sample sizes. They include people with varied characteristics, unlike trials. They're lower cost than trials. They're quicker and ethics are simpler as you're not intervening. Long-term follow-up, you can have long-term follow-up for many outcomes. And they include people taking treatments in the clinical setting, in the in actual real-world setting, so in clinical care. But um, the problem is that we talked about randomization, randomized controlled trials and observation analysis. Obviously, people are not in clinical care, your GP, you're not randomized to treatment. Well, most of the time, you're not randomized to treatment. So that means there's no randomization. The big problem with observational data is, is confounding. And other biases that are important for electronic health record databases include time-related biases. Okay, and that, what, what I mean by that is if you're using big data, you've got a big database already, you have time for your, your patient, your people for sort of 20 years, not just for the, it's not just people turning up and being recruited to study. So management of that time can cause a lot of problems in observational data. So then how about observational studies designed like randomized controlled trials? So potential benefits of doing this, of designing observational studies based on RCTs have been recognized since the 1950s. But actually, it's in the last decade that the number of observational studies that have been performed with design aspects based on randomized controlled trials has really increased in the last 10 years. And a couple of years ago, NICE published their real world evidence framework. So it's the website details all of this. And this is basically what they were saying. This is to improve the quality of real world evidence that informs their guidance. And you look at the methods for real world studies of comparative effectiveness, it's all based around the target trial approach. That's what they're talking about with real world evidence. Let's have a look at that then. So studies, but what we're gonna look at now is study design, observational study design based upon a hypothetical randomized controlled trial. So in 2016, there's this really famous paper by Anand Robbins, 
basically talks about the introduce the target trial emulation framework. And what this is, is basically what they're saying is that when you design an observational study, you should first of all describe a hypoth hypothetical target trial, which is the trial that you'd like to conduct if it's feasible. You then emulate that trial in um, uh, um, using the available, available observational data. And in what they defined is a protocol. So every time you do an observational study, you should think about a hypothetical trial, and these are the elements that you should think, think about. And there's lots of literature out there on there, so it's looked like a protocol, and eligibility criteria, treatment strategies, assignment procedures, follow-up, et cetera, et cetera. And you might be looking at this and thinking, well, I kind of, I do that anyway. I do decent, I do good observational analysis. You know, I, I follow strobe or whatever. So what's the point of doing this? Why do you need this target trial framework? And the argument is that explicitly, if you explicitly emulate a target trial, what this actually helps with is really helps with clarification of the research question. And it aids researchers in avoiding common design pitfalls when analyzing stored electronic health data, particularly related to time. And there's a commentary there um, if you're interested, that provides more thoughts about this. And there's been really very rapid uptake of target trial emulation. So there was a systematic review last year, mm -hmm. 200 studies um, using this based on hypothetical trials. But you have enduring uncertainty. So if you're emulating a hypothetical target trial, there's a central challenge of observational analysis remains. And basically that is, how do we know if you've emulated a hypothetical trial, the, the results you get, how do you know that they're the same results for a randomized controlled trial of the same question? But how do you know whether your emulation is going to be successful, whether it's been successful? But then one way of sort of handling that is to emulate an actual existing randomized controlled trial. So you take an existing randomized controlled trial, that's the target trial and what you in, that you base your observation analysis on an existing <clears throat> trial. You then, when you've done your observation analysis, you compare the results with the randomized controlled trial and that's a step known as benchmarking. There's a paper there that goes into that sort of concept. But what's the point? Why would you bother emulating an existing randomized controlled trial? They've already done, somebody's already done a trial of that question, they've got results, so why would you want to then do an observational data? And the key motivation is you want, you can increase the confidence in your observational data source that you can answer that research question of interest. So if you do your emulation then benchmark, you've got confidence in your approach. What you can then do is you can extend your analysis to people within the same data source that weren't included in the trial or were under, under, underrepresented in the trial. So the sort of high level procedure basically is that you have a protocol of an actual existing randomized controlled trial. You develop a protocol for emulating that in big data. You then perform the analysis and benchmark it against this randomized controlled trial. And then what you can do is extend your analysis and big data to patients who weren't included in the trial, but are treated with drugs in clinical care. So there's a number of different terms, unfortunately, because it's epidemiology for the trials, the index trial, reference trial, or origin trial has been used in the literature. But the key point is that if you benchmark against a trial, you can then extend your analysis to um, people who weren't included in that trial. I'm just going to go over a few exa two examples of that that I worked on. Um, first of all, one of them is, is related to the on-target trial. And this was a landmark trial that was... Um, it looked at the drugs ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and it was looking at prevention of cardiovascular um, outcomes. And what it found is that, that, that ARBs were equivalent to ACE inhibitors in terms of, of doing that. ACE inhibitors were the standards and AR, ARBs were new for that indication. And this trial, the results of this trial actually informed the licensing of ARBs for this question. So basically that's most of this is, is, is what I've just said. So the reference trial, uh, the population of people with diabetes, the exposure with the two drugs that I talked about, the outcomes were cardiovascular mortality. They had a sample size of about 17,000, and they randomized the treatment. It was intention to treat, and they used COX regression. And what they found was it was a non-inferiority trial, and they found that ARBs were equivalent to ACE inhibitors for these outcomes. But importantly, underrepresented groups in the trial were people aged over 75, females and people with chronic kidney disease, all people that obviously get treated with these drugs. So um, 
what we did, we emulated this in, in uh, UK CPRD. And so what you set out to do is to try and get a, a population as, as similar as possible to the trial population. Um, that is, there's a load of steps there that I'm not talking about, but basically that's, these are the bits, the first three bits, you try, we try to get exactly the same as the trial. Um, but then we have a sample size of over 100,000 rather than the 17,000 that were in the, in the trial. The yeah, analysis approach is slightly different because uh, there's no randomization, so you have to use parentity score weighted analysis. That's what we used. But what we found was that actually we were able to find the same results. The ARBs were equivalent to ACE inhibitors for this question. Um, we then extended the analysis to underrepresented groups, so people, older people, females, and people with chronic kidney disease, and basically found that the uh, the the associations, the effects seen in on target, also applied to these groups that weren't studied in the original trial. So the conclusion was that basically the on-target results are generalizable to those, um, those specific trial under underrepresented groups. The second study that we looked at with uh, at emulating the trial was called the Aristotle trial. And this was looking at all anticoagulants. So this is related to the prevention of cardiovascular outcomes in people with atrial fibrillation. And um, what it looked at was basically the new um, or anticoagulant apexaban compared it to the standard care warfarin. And warfarin has a lot of problems because you have to be able to keep patients in a specific therapeutic range, which is quite difficult. Otherwise, there's lots of safety out, safety problems. Um, so basically, this was people with atrial fibrillation um, and at least one risk factor. It's looking at this new drug, apexaban, versus warfarin. The outcomes were stroke um, and also all-cause mortality. And what they found actually was that apixaban, it was a non-inferiority trial, but they found that in green, you can see that apixaban was superior to um, warfarin for stroke and um, mortality. But there was an underrepresented, underrepresented group was that people whose warfarin therapy was well, well controlled. What that means is that the trial basically recruited people who weren't doing that well on warfarin, okay, which trials tend to do. They just recruit people who think they're going to get affected. But, but NICE, when they, NICE used this trial, basically, they said that, um, that basically there might be an issue with the UK data because even the loads more people who actually are on well-controlled warfarin. And so we emulated that. Um, similar sort of approach is actually quite, it, actually the, the sample size was smaller because of the approach that we took. But what we actually found, we, we didn't find superiority of apixaban to warfarin. We found that it was non-inferior. But when we did a sub-analysis, basically looking at these underrep underrepresented groups, which was people whose warfarin therapy was well controlled, we actually found that there was an increase in mortality mm -hmm. in that group. So the conclusion was that um, Aristotle results may not be generalized, generalizable to people on warfarin that is well controlled, even though this trial found that. Um, I think that's my 12 minutes. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's the, that is basically a commentary covering everything that I've talked about. Um, yeah, any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, really. I was wondering whether you have thought about going the other way around. So, because if you make it like nice, it probably still don't work. So, have you considered how to use observational data to design trials that um, get rid of some of the disadvantages? Um. I haven't considered that. I know it's, uh, I mean, I guess the first point to say is that, that really this kind of work is, is, is certainly not to get rid of trials. It's, it's really just sort of work um, in parallel with, with trials. I haven't done that, any of that work, but it's certainly there are people doing it. And I know that, yeah, that, that, that's an area of work that a lot of people are working on. So, yeah. Missing this in observational data is kind of quite well known and it's missing not at random typically in the IE syndrome, healthy or whatever. The trial data you're brought in for those observations regardless. How much <coughs> extra effort or time goes into figuring out bats? How do you deal with missingness? I mean, yeah, you have a question. So, yeah, I'm sorry. So, um, that was a question about that in trials, you're, you have very little missingness, but in observational data, there's going to be a lot of missingness. Um, yeah, so that's a problem, not just with this type of work, but with um, any type of observational study and big data. And we, I mean, that is, there are lots of issues with these studies that you have to try and kind of think of in advance. And you can say, like, I think there's going to be a real problem with missing data here. 
um, selection bias confounding, even though we're doing all these things. And I think in terms of missing this, it's you have to think quite carefully about the trial that you're trying to emulate and uh, how um, confident are you in the outcomes and maybe the covariance as well that you're looking at that there's going to be missing data or not, or a lot of missing data. It's going to, if there's going to be too much, then I wouldn't bother trying to emulate that. So this is quite limited to only those trials where you can really emulate because of the quality of the data, yeah. One last question. I really enjoyed your talk, thanks. Um, your two examples that you gave were really nice. Both compared the observational data, both your groups have made a decision to treat. So, if you're underrepresented groups in trials, my worry would be sometimes clinicians decide that you're basically too uncertain, we don't treat. And is there any way to explore the extent to which capturing the truly underrepresented groups? Treated. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure. What, what do you mean? In, you mean in the observational data? So if you're if you're using these studies to say we have confidence of the effect of parents in people that were not in the trial because we've looked at them, treated on them, and yeah, the is, is there any? Maybe yeah. the clinicians are weightier. And, yeah. and those people, by definition, not being your analysis either. Yeah, yeah. And is there, obviously, this is maybe not the tool to look at that, but yeah, is yeah. there a literature around that or other approaches to trying to see to what extent? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question was basically that if we're looking in groups that weren't in the trial, because of the trial evidence, there may be hesitancy to prescribe to those people. Um, and we assess that effect at all. And we haven't done anything around that. I mean, Again, there are lots of issues around things like that you get in observation data that you get, don't get in trials, like treatment switching with a new drug that's introduced, that kind of thing. But we haven't specifically looked at hesitancy around prescribing to these groups. But it, it would be, I think it would become particularly important if you find a result that's different to the trial. If you find a result that's the same to the, the, same to the trial, that's kind of reassured. But if it's different, there's a whole area, really, what do you do then generally? But that would might be one of the things that you would want to try and explore a bit more. But we haven't we didn't do it with these two. Yeah, good point. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Callum Lindsay, who's going to talk about missingness in healthcare data. Oh, not missingness in healthcare data. As soon as you started talking about missingness there, it's like people are gonna get awfully confused. Because we are talking about missingness, but we're talking about it's different. Um, sort of phenomenon. Why on earth is the cursor just the vanish? There we go. Okay. Yes, all good. So yeah, hi everybody. I'm Cal. Um, I work in the Department for uh, General Practice and Primary Care, along with my colleagues, Andrea and David, both here as well from the project. And we're going to talk about this phenomenon called missingness in healthcare, explore some of our findings to do with the causes of missingness, and particularly focus on some of our work trying to find interventions or trying to identify some promising interventions. Uh, around missingness, which in this case refers to the phenomenon of multiple missed appointments, or more specifically, the repeated tendency of the patients not to take up opportunities for care with a negative impact on the person and their life chances. And this definition comes from previous epidemiological work um, that shows the patients that miss a greater number of appointments in primary care um, tend to have a greater number of long-term physical and mental health conditions, experience a greater socioeconomic deprivation and have far, far worse mortality outcomes. And that these, um, the mortality outcomes in particular uh, for patients with comparable and long-term health conditions are related to the number of appointments missed. More appointments missed, the worse the outcomes tend to be, particularly when it comes to mental health uh, conditions. Um, and thus we have this kind of two-pronged definition not only the missing appointments, but their particularly negative impact on the person and their life chances. And our project um, has a goal of working out what the causes are of missing this and ultimately what might be done to address it. Um, methodologically, we took uh, a realist approach combining a realist synthesis, uh, a literature review, um, and a realist, no, sorry, a realist evaluation interviews and a realist synthesis literature review we had our initial kind of theory using stakeholder uh, groups um, and kind of theories from the team and some substantial theories about what might be causing multiple missed appointments, refined through the literature, refined through interviews with 
experts by experience uh, and uh, professionals in different fields, 198 papers, I think, 61 interviews. And we've had four stakeholder advisory meetings that have helped us refine our theory and look at our interventions, in particular intervention design, trying to identify what might work to address missingness, who it might work for, and what circumstances might be most beneficial. Um, so very, very quickly, because we want to focus on our interventions today, um, the causes that we've identified for our work are overlapping. They occur across the patient journey, um, and they occur in the interaction between patients, services, and wider social and structural contexts. This is a very, very brief summary, a summary of what those findings are. Very rarely would a single category apply just to one patient, but often people have multiple things going on, experience multiple access issues from not feeling like the service is for them, not designed for them. It's not necessary to attend. It's not helpful. It's not an appropriate place, or indeed it's a place that isn't safe. Um, that might relate to past experiences of mistreatment, of poor communication, power imbalances and offers of care that don't fit with the person's circumstances or their understanding of themselves or their health. There's a logistical element around travel. That can be the availability of travel and public transport. It can be the accessibility of travel, the cost of travel, but also things to do with mental health um, and anxiety or agoraphobia and things like that. Um, rules for accessing care often we like to pretend, I think, that primary care is this great, accessible, easy to understand and easy to navigate world. But in reality, uh, what our findings have told us, that isn't the case. It's often very difficult for people. Um, there's an awful lot of gatekeeping, delays in getting appointments, inflexibility in the system, and ultimately errors or mistakes in, in the appointments given to people or how they're recorded um, that can get in the way. Competing demands. This in particular with the findings that we have around multi-morbidity and the findings we have around socioeconomic deprivation, I think the focus in this one is that um, there are patients who are exposed to a greater number of competing and essential demands and have fewer resources to manage those demands and to meet all of those demands. Perhaps have to engage in prioritization of other appointments, of financial well-being, of caring relationships, or are potentially cared for by other people who have competing demands and ultimately their, their physical survival. Um, and then finally, connected to all of these and kind of as a thread underpinning this, this element of mistrust or distrust in healthcare related to experiences of stigma, trauma, mistreatment, discrimination. So the existing approach to intervention, we found in our interviews and we found in our literature review that there are a lot of problems in how uh, missed appointments are currently understood. Um, Firstly, they often focus on the problem as an issue for services, not for patients, uh, and a problem that's caused by patients who are irresponsible, chaotic, wasteful, um, deviant in some way, um, creating an element of waste and of inefficiency. Um, when those problems are explored a little bit further in the research in particular, there's not really any exploration of causes. You get a lot of statistical work identifying who might be missing appointments but very, very little work actually looking into why people are missing appointments. And the work that does often is very, very shallow, surveys, single word answers, and often to get to data missing this, I suppose. Um, particular patient groups, those most likely to be missing appointments aren't really well represented in the data. And when it comes to interventions and fixing the problems, building on those two flaws, we end up with very simplistic solutions, very, very flawed outcome measures across the whole patient population and not kind of stratifying in terms of inequalities. And again, data missing this, we have recruitment and sampling issues. And the interventions very, very rarely explore who is impacted and how they're impacted. You will typically just have a paper that says, we have these patients, 10% of them missed appointments. We sent them a reminder, now 8% of them missed appointments. It was a great success, well done. And there's no kind of stratification, no exploration of what's going on. So we, we feel that this is a very situational and a flawed lens to explore. And we are kind of positing this idea that we should have a missingness lens, um, a different way of thinking about uh, missed appointments. So our intervention development process primarily been through the stakeholder advisory group of nine professionals, nine experts by experience from multiple relevant fields, inclusion health, homelessness, uh, migration, um, and a lot of folks who actually cross both the expert by experience and professional boundaries. Um, and we had our 
process of understanding the problem, clarifying what causes are kind of malleable, and we're going to focus today on bringing about change. Um, which has really occurred in second, third, and last week, the fourth of our stakeholder advisory groups. We've gotten together and asked our group to help us refine our understanding of the problem and what we're going to do about it. Now, this is the first time I've presented this particular slide. Um, Andrea and David haven't seen it. Um, and I'd be curious to know your thoughts on it later. But essentially, we want to change that paradigm and build our interventions on a different set of principles we call taking a missing this lens. So taking all those flaws from before and turning them into strengths of an interventional approach that would underpin whatever activities we actually end up coming up with. So from responsibilizing patients to actually ensuring services understand they have a responsibility and need to make a commitment to address the barriers to care. From a really shallow and kind of monocausal perspective to a much more complex perspective of what's happening, not only for individual patients, but within the wider service and within the wider community. Um, from uh, that view across the patient population to actually prioritizing um, patients in the greatest needs uh, or patients in circumstances that make it more likely that they're not going to be able to access care. Um, from really technical or practical and logistical solutions like reminders or more recently artificial intelligence based stuff. A more relational approach, communication at the heart. This is particularly what we've heard from our stakeholder group. And something that's oriented around different ideas of safety, making sure that people feel culturally safe, relationally safe, um, and that is mindful of, of this concept of structural safety as well. And um, that is not only about the medical aspects of healthcare, but looks at social determinants of health, poverty, and marginalization, and actually looks at a broader view of health and well being. And I think we see it's crucial that primary care plays a role in those particular activities. Um, and then moving from responsibilizing primary care only to collaboration with other services um, and bringing in patient agents choice. Um, so we've come up with a set of interventions. We have kind of described it as a package or a suite of reinforcing interventions, overlapping interventions. Our sense is that really, because of the complexity of the issue, because so many different things are happening for different patients, we probably need all of them. Um, and then they need to be implemented in a needs-led, patient-centered way oriented around those principles that we just talked about. And we're also aware that there are broader structural and policy things that are going on that we, I think, will continue to advocate for, but are potentially outside the scope of the interventions that we're looking at. So just a quick overview of what those are. Um, at its very, very core, we have that idea of embedding a missing this lens, the box at the top. So that's building up a local picture of what's actually happening, what's influencing missing this for a patient population making sure that staff have an understanding of the issue, creating an environment that rather than having a negative or punitive approach to missed appointments is more supportive and has more of an understanding of the, the inequalities aspects. Um, and that builds in monitoring accountability around multiple, multiple missed appointments within services, building up a kind of local bank of data using different sources of knowledge, speaking to patients about why they are struggling to attend, about what's happening, about the barriers that they have, building relationships with those patients, but also using potentially quantitative data um, to build an individual picture for patients, but also a collective picture for practices for communities, even on a much broader scale. And um, we have this concept of wayfinding. I think a lot of the time when we've looked at our interventions, what's come up is having a person, whether it's a link worker, um, or or somebody similar who helps do a lot of the kinds of specific activities um, that will help people to access care, whether that's meeting their broader needs and reducing those competing demands, engaging in advocacy work and reducing those communicative issues and power room balances, um, and essentially taking a broader kind of look than just primary care. And then these other ones are kind of more specific activities that kind of fit within what that worker might do or might be able to help. The relational aspect is really important, ensuring that people have a choice of the person that they see and more control over the person they see, addressing any communicative needs uh, within the appointment, any power dynamics that need to be addressed. Situational kind of contact before appointment. Reminders have a role, but perhaps they have to be personalized. Perhaps people need help to navigate or orient themselves. Explore the kinds of barriers that are going on or after an appointment, people need to be contacted to check in to offer further help. Prioritizing missing patients for reducing that kind of gatekeeping influence and having 
more flexible forms of access to choice. And then finally, with transport, um, taking a, a kind of step to needs led approach. There's lots of options with transportation, as you can imagine. Um, and really where we are just now is, is refining those, getting a bit more detail into those. We had our last stakeholder meeting last week. We're still in the process of working out exactly what we can got from that, but it was a great conversation. And yeah, that's kind of where we are at the moment. So I'll happily take any questions. Yeah. Controls things. That's come up for you. So just for the folks online, the question is in, in secondary care when people miss appointments, they're often either chucked to the back of the queue or or um if they are referred again or future referrals are refused and whether that's come up in the project. And it definitely has come up in the interviews, it's come up in the papers that we've looked at, and it kind of fits within that that initial problem conception of the patient is problematic they're causing a problem for the service and really what you just need to do is be punitive or be harsh or draw a very clear binary and and, and i think we found that you know we've had gps uh, in our stakeholder group talk about how frustrating it is not that the patient has necessarily missed the appointment but that the service has taken that as a reason to take them out um, and that actually that patient should probably be prioritized for access rather than deprioritized and put to the back of the queue. Because the initial epidemiological findings were that secondary care appointments, the patients that were missing multiple primary care appointments and secondary care appointments were essentially the same. Same kind of patient profile. So it has come up. We're mostly focused on primary care at the minute, but um, yeah, I think the findings we're trying to, to, to communicate and trying to label them in a way that they could apply potentially. Thank you. One more question. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that. It was great. Um, I just had to talk to the person about the stakeholder engagement part. Mm. Were you able to get representation from people who were patients who had missed appointments yeah. before? Uh, and I suppose the second question on that one is uh, on the general struggle of stakeholder engagement from but then but they just feel like we're certain of the or and where they have to look at or kind of product. Mm. Uh, are you finding ways of, of promoting their buy-in and communication with them? Yeah, that's a good question. So with the the two parts of the question for the folks online, first one, did we have a good representation of patient uh, expertise by experience of missed appointments? And secondly, how did we manage to kind of create an ownership of a process? So we did have Good representation i feel like we so much of the research in this area is like the patients that miss multiple appointments are just too difficult so they'll just live over there and we won't talk to them and we've found that with a little bit of hard work and a decent approach you can recruit whether it's for interviews or the stakeholder group you can bring people in we've had good continuity and that i think has helped create a sense of ownership with folks coming in and building on work that they've previously been able to contribute to now that we're getting into finalizing and then disseminating and stuff like that, I think we're going to have to talk a bit more about how we're going to share our stuff with the group in a way that makes it feel like they have contributed to it. Um, but we've, you know, we've constantly been going back and forth with the group between sessions, and I think we've done a reasonable amount of ownership. I hope so. Thank you for one very last question. Um, quick. Okay, thanks. Um, Lisa, um, I know the model and model of the university, it seems that many of the experiences of care are fundamental to me clinically. Um, how do you have intervention that like, people that? Yes. Um, that goes everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, is there any 
that is a that is a really difficult one because we are talking about here about lifelong experiences, not just in primary care, but familial care experiences, other social institutions, schools, you know, things like that. Um, when you look at the research on dealing with like experiences of stigma or stigma interventions, it's just more staff training. They're just like, what if we just train the staff really, really, really well? Um, and that shows a bit of a lack of imagination, I think. Um, I would say there's not a great answer for that, in particularly in the literature. I think in a stakeholder group, there has been a lot of conversations about treating people respectfully and, and being invitational and in how you approach it. So actually reaching out to people, not from a, a place of reprimanding or not even from a place of, of like trying to mine their data, but just actually reaching, taking that first step and reaching out and being persistent and being proactive, I think is probably a fairly core part of that. And then hopefully you overcome some of those things. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.